Well, good evening. I want to welcome you to another time here uh, in the chapel. Uh, so tonight uh, we will be uh, looking at scripture. We'll be praying together. Uh, we will be uh, looking uh, at uh, some brief texts from the lectionary. Um, we'll be reciting the Apostles' Creed and we'll be receiving Holy Communion together. So if you have access to bread and wine uh, and you want to join me later, uh, that would be wonderful. So to begin tonight, blessed be the God and Father, Son, Holy Spirit, blessed be his kingdom now and forevermore. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Blessed be the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. So glad that you could join me tonight. Uh, we're going to be praying our collect uh, from this uh, week, which is um, the third Sunday after uh, Lent. So join me uh, in praying that together uh, from the Book of Common Prayer. Let's pray together. Almighty God, who uh, seest that we have no power of ourselves to help ourselves, keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversity which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to be looking at several passages of Scripture. The first one is from Exodus uh, chapter 20. I won't read the whole thing. It's chapters uh, chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. It says, Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for the Lord your God is a jealous God, punishing the children for the iniquity of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me. But notice verse 6. But showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and consecrated it. We'll go ahead and wrap up this text uh, with these few verses. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave, or ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. May God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing and the understanding and the applying of his word. Um, now we uh, jump down to Psalm 19, um, and we're just going to read verses uh, 1 through 6. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaim his handiwork. Day to day they pour forth speech, and night to night they declare knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out throughout all the earth and the words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom for his wedding canopy. And like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the ends of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. 
and nothing is hidden from its heat. Our reading tonight from uh, the epistle uh, in the Gospels is from the epistle of St. Paul to the church in Corinth, uh, chapter 1, verses 1, uh, verses 18 through 21, uh, 25 of chapter 1. Notice what the Apostle Paul says. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the man who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. Uh, some other translations speak about uh, the cross of Jesus Christ being foolishness to those who are perishing. Verse 21, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified and a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are the called of God, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for God's foolishness is wiser than man's wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Now a reading from the Holy Gospel according to John chapter 2 verses 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables making a whip of cords. He drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here and stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remember, remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken to them. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would add a blessing to the reading and the hearing and the applying and the understanding of your word. We know, Lord, that your word is truth, that you will never let your word return void, but it will always accomplish the purposes for which you send it. And so, Lord, I pray that you would send forth your word Lord, that you would use this crooked stick to preach your straight truth. Bless us now, we pray, in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, tonight I want us to notice uh, from our text um, and from the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, what the Spirit is saying to the churches, because we know that the Word of God is for the people of God. And we noticed in our first reading from Exodus 20, we find the law that the Lord gave to his people. We understand that before the law was given, uh, there, was, uh, there were saints upon the earth. We can think of uh, Adam and Eve. We can think of um, there was Cain and Abel. Of course, uh, Cain was evil. Um, God used Abel, who was righteous. Uh, then uh, Adam and Eve would have Seth, and the righteous line would run through, um, through Seth. And so we find that there were righteous people in um, the Old Testament. We know there was Enoch, 
uh, who walked with God for 300 years, and then he was not found, for he was taken up. Uh, he was essentially uh, caught up. He was essentially raptured. He did not taste death, just like Elijah, who was caught up in the fiery chariot. Uh, so there were other righteous uh, people in the Bible. We know about Noah uh, and his progeny. And so the law was given, and, but prior to the law, uh, we know that in the days of Noah, it had become so evil, it had become so wicked that God essentially uh, was using a, a, a literary uh, phrase there, a literary device to show how grieved he was. He said that he had, he had regretted that he had made humankind because humankind had become so evil and wicked. And we know from Jesus in the New Testament that in the last days before God consummates uh, human history, that it is going to return to a time that it is like the days of Noah. Um, and so we're finding that today that wickedness is increasing at an ever expanding rate, uh, particularly in the West. Um, and we don't even, we almost don't even need to define it anymore because it's so painstakingly clear to everyone uh, what is going on. And so God gave his people, he gave the world the law. And he, he begins by saying, I am the Lord, your God. I am the Lord, your God, who, and he reminds them of his great work of deliverance in their lives. He delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptian Pharaoh and the bondage of the Egyptian regime, which was one of the strongest empires uh, of its time. And so the Lord wants them to know that he is the Lord. Pharaoh is not the Lord. No wicked ruler on the earth is the Lord. Amen. Uh, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the hand of slavery. And you shall have no other gods except me, the Lord says. And he said, you shall not make of yourselves an idol uh, in any form that is in heaven or on earth or under the earth. Uh, you shall not make an idol and bow down and worship it. That's what his instruction is. He does not want them to make other objects to worship. And he knows that he created us God created us for worship. He created us to find our meaning in him. And as St. Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee, O God. So we find that we were created to worship and we don't find our fulfillment when we seek to worship other things or people or objects. That's why we always come up empty uh, as the country music song said, looking for love in all the wrong places. That's why people today, they try everything, but they still keep searching because they still haven't found the true object of their worship, which is God. That's why God told them, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods except me. So he told them not to make idols Uh he encouraged them, right, to worship him alone. Um, he essentially said, uh, do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Um, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. So the Lord is encouraging us. He's challenging us. He's commanding us to take a day off per week. Let me ask you, do you take a day off per week? You take at least one day, right? Even if you're in a business, let your machines rest. You need to rest. You need to go and worship with the people of God and be renewed. Maybe you need to take a nap, right? Uh, enjoy the fellowship of friends or company in addition to church. But the, uh, the seventh day, God set that as a precedent um, in time, in, spa in space, <coughs> as a day of rest. And as Christians, we are not to continue just day in and day out working and not stopping and acknowledging God. He commanded us, right? He commanded us to take the Sabbath rest and worship. He says, honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long upon the earth. And so our young people, do you respect your parents? 
Do you speak to your parents respectfully? Do you treat your elders uh, as elders with respect? Honor your father and your mother. So what? That your days may be long upon the earth. And so he goes on. Uh, he gives other uh, prohibitions. Do not murder. Uh, do not commit adultery. Uh, do not steal. Uh, do not bear false witness against your neighbor. And then don't covet your neighbor's house, his goods, uh, his animal, his wife, all these things that your neighbor has, his car, right? He's saying, don't covet them. Don't say to yourself, well, why does he have that? I should have that. It's not fair that he has that and I don't have that. That's coveting. And, he, and just take your prayer. If you don't have what you need, just take your request to God. He's saying, don't covet what your neighbor has. So in Psalm 19, we, we see this continuation of the glory of God, of the sovereignty of God, um, that God is uh, in control. He released the people from uh, Egyptian bondage and that the very heavens declare now the glory of God. His law declares his glory uh, because they, it protects us and provides for us. And it points to Jesus Christ who is the end of the law, who is the fulfillment of the law, who enables us through his cross to be forgiven, but also to receive the Holy Spirit so that we can obey his word. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament proclaim his handiwork. Day to day they pour forth speech, and night to night they declare knowledge. Now moving down to Corinthians we see that the sovereign God who is in control, who has given us his law, he's given us his word. The heavens declare the glory of God. The message of the cross, we see, is foolishness to this world that is perishing. It is foolishness to this world that is perishing. Now, why is that? Because God said that he would destroy the wisdom of the wise. Now, I want you to notice we're talking here about the elite, about the intellectuals, about those who are in their pride, who think they know better than God, who are themselves. They have set themselves up as demigods, as gods. And we can see our world is full of them. Richard Dawkins wrote his book, The God Delusion. Christopher Hitchens, another atheist. Bertrand Russell, all of these men, very prideful, very arrogant. They want to be God. They want to make their own rules. They want to define their own reality. And so we find here that the Lord is saying that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Amen? Haven't you come to the end of yourself, the end of your pride, and you said to yourself, this world is not about me. I am not in charge of this world. God is in charge of this world, and I'm going to put my trust in him, and I'm going to let him shelter me under the shadow of his wing. That's the true heart of a believer. Humility. That's why the word of God uh, says in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth. That's the process by which we're saved. We come to Christ in brokenness and in meekness. And he says what? You come to me in meekness and brokenness, and you put your trust in him, and he says the meek shall inherit the earth. The meek shall inherit the earth. You see the wise and the proud and those who are controlling things now and money laundering through Eastern Europe, right, and, and, and sabotaging elections and destroying the unborn and destroying uh, gender and, and human life and everything that God made sacred. God will humble them in the end. There's a, there's a great fiery judgment waiting for these wicked people that you see in this world who are seemingly in power now, they will not be in power later because God will play second to no one. Amen? And so we found that here in Corinthians. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of the world, the world did not know God through wisdom. And God decided, notice this was a deliberate act of God. God decided through the foolishness of the proclamation to save those who believe. To the Jews, it all appeared to be, uh, they, they demanded some signs, right? They wanted signs. They wanted miracles. And what did Jesus do? 
Jesus gave them signs. He gave them miracles. And many in the house of Israel believed. What about the Greeks? Greeks desire wisdom. And so Jesus gave them wisdom. We have Ecclesiastes. We have the book of Job. We have the book of Proverbs. We have the book of Psalms. Uh, we find that in John 1, Jesus is the divine logos. He is the reason behind all things. So to the Jews, they wanted signs. Jesus gave them signs. And to the Greeks, they wanted wisdom. And God has given them wisdom. But we proclaim, he says, Christ a cru crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are being saved, those who are being called by God, Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God, for God's foolishness is wiser than man's wisdom, and God's wisdom is stronger than human strength. Now notice in our last reading in the Holy Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, given to the Apostle John in chapter 2, we find that Passover is near and Jesus goes up into Jerusalem and he finds that they have made his father's house a marketplace. They are overcharging uh, animals. They are overcharging people for the sacrifices that must be made at Passover. Uh, they are raising the prices uh, substantially so people can't adequately afford to sacrifice. And let's just let's just say that you didn't have the money to, you know, I mean, they've raised the prices nearly double what these animals were worth, tax upon tax upon tax. So basically, they're preventing people from worshiping properly. Imagine this, if you went to a church and you were struggling financially, and you walk in the door and they said, oh, uh, unless you can, you know, cough up $5,000 right here on the spot, you can't come in and worship. Well, needless to say, you'd probably never go back to that church again. Well, they were doing something similar here in God's temple. They were, they were uh, keeping people from worshiping God. And that's why Jesus was so indignant. One of the gospels says that uh, essentially that justice is best served cold, that Jesus sat down and took his time making that whip. Right? Have you ever been angry at someone or something and you just... You had a really short fuse and you just like that. Well, Jesus didn't do that. She sat down, he took his time, and he made this whip. And he drove them out. As one uh, pastor said, he said, I hope there's a DVD on this. I want to see this one day when we get to heaven. I want to see Jesus driving out these evil, uh, wicked money changers uh, who were ripping the people off and pushing the people out of God's house. And so we find uh, that Jesus said, stop making my father's house a marketplace, a marketplace. And his disciples remembered that Jesus had a zeal for his father's house that consumed him. You see, Jesus had come. One of the primary reasons Jesus came is so that you and I and the world can know the Father. That's why Jesus came. He said, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. He said, I have come to destroy the works of the devil. What does the devil come for? The devil has only come to rob and to kill, to steal and to destroy. And Jesus said, I have come that you might have life. I have come that you might have life. I have come to destroy the works of the devil. I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. And so Jesus had a zeal for his father's house because Jesus has a zeal and a love for you that expands far beyond human conce uh, conception uh, and, and understanding. That's why John 3, 16, one of the most quotable verses you'll ever see. You see it at football games. People put it on banners hanging off the side of where they're sitting. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? But have everlasting life. Dear friends, Jesus has come so that you can have everlasting life. Jesus has come so that you can know the Father, this Father who has given us the law to protect and provide for us and to point us 
to the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He has come. He's declaring the glory of God. As we notice in the Psalms, the heavens declare the glory of God. Uh, he has veiled this gospel. It is foolishness to those who are perishing, to those who are arrogant and uh, wise in their own eyes. They will perish in their own folly and wisdom. But God has made another way. He's come through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. He laid his life down on that torture device invented by the Phoenicians and perfected by the Romans. And he will not share his glory with anyone else. And he does not want his house obstructed with uh, marketeers who are there to make money off of the innocent and the vulnerable. He wants them to be able to freely come into his house and worship him and receive him. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad we have a Savior like that? So in closing tonight, I trust that your faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. I trust that you are doing well in your faith. Look to God. Turn your eyes to him. He is your help and your salvation. Amen. Well, join me now in the Apostles' Creed before we confess our sins and receive holy communion together. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, take just a moment, if you have access to bread and wine, I would invite you to go and to uh, bring that forth, and we will receive Holy Communion together. Let's pray together. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and to death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us unto you, the God and Father of all. Jesus stretched out his arms upon the cross and he offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. Amen. Lord, we humbly ask that you would cleanse us of our sins. We know that as 1 John 1, 9 states, that if we will confess our sin, you are faithful and just and will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thanks be to God. Amen. On the night that our Lord Jesus Christ was handed over to suffer and to die, our Lord Jesus Christ, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. <clears throat> After supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is given for you and for the sins of many. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. As we close this mini service tonight, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Amen. To proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. And Christ will come again. Amen. I hope that this has been an encouragement to you. That all the things that are going on in your life. All the things that are going on 
in your family and in this world, all the trouble within and all the trouble without, that you will take your hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the Father who sent his Son and uh, has opened your heart uh, to them through the power of his Holy Spirit. And he will minister to you both now and forevermore. Amen.